but don't limit yourself. Don't don't fall into the level of a, of a bias of like, oh, she's just an 18 year old white girl. She can't hurt me. That's a very dangerous path to go down. A Kentucky teen is charged with attempted murder after she allegedly attacked a police officer with a screwdriver. She's clearly had a screwdriver in her pocket. She fled law enforcement. She used that tool to try to escape. So it, it was clearly a weapon in the moment. It was might not have been designed to be a weapon, but that's ultimately what she deployed it as. Officials say this woman, 18-year-old Kenzie Van Arsdale, stabbed an officer in the face in the early morning hours of November 4th. It happened in Mount Washington, Kentucky, about 30 minutes south of Louisville. Retired police sergeant Ashton Pack says it's likely something was off with Van Arsdale that led her to stab the officer. This woman clearly has something going on uh, in her brain. Something wasn't right, even if it was just a panic flight fight response. And maybe she's maybe she comes from a world where no one has ever told her what she can and cannot do. And this law enforcement officer shows up and says, these are the rules, you cannot be here. And then maybe she just made a choice right then and there to try to hurt him to get away. So you just can't assume, you have to be prepared, but you can't be paranoid either. You can't treat everyone you come across as though they're a, you know, a sociopathic killer. You have to be safe, you have to be professional, and that's where the training really comes in for cops. Officials say it was about six o'clock in the morning on Saturday when Mount Washington police officer Mark Brammer began his shift by unlocking the gate at Lindsay Duval Park on the city's west side. Authorities say that's when Brammer saw Van Arsdale and asked her to come over to his squad. At first, Van Arsdale was cooperative, but later she changed her tune and ran off. Brammer followed, and when he caught up with her, Van Arsdale allegedly stabbed him in the face with a screwdriver. She stabbed him just three inches above his left eye. So I do believe if you stab a police officer, even with a screwdriver, you could easily articulate an attempted murder charge there. And ultimately, the design and original purpose of a screwdriver is not to kill people. But if you have to think about the fact that anything, any kind of edged weapon, baseball bat, a screwdriver, uh, an edged weapon, not necessarily even a knife designed for defense, box cutters. I mean, 9-11 happened because a bunch of guys had box cutters in their pockets. So it's something to really consider where what is an actual weapon Yes, firearms and knives are kind of seen and, and presumed to be weapons of kind of to defend yourself or even commit c crimes and murder with. But again, this she's clearly had a screwdriver in her pocket. She fled law enforcement. She used that tool to try to escape. So it, it was clearly a weapon in the moment. It was might not have been designed to be a weapon, but that's ultimately what she deployed it as. Pack says it's possible the attempted murder charge against Van Arsdale changes but she's still accused of a very serious offense. If the elements of the crime to attempted murder are met, then the law enforcement officers who, who arrested her will charge her with that. Ultimately, when she goes to court, she'll have her day in court, she'll have her attorney who can represent her interests, and then you'll have the prosecutor who will represent the state's interests, and somewhere in the middle maybe we'll find, uh, I don't know if there'll be a, maybe a plea agreement or a compromise here, but yeah, it, it's a very serious charge. If you stab a police officer, I think you should, in all reality, the officer could have probably shot and killed her. And so whatever tactics were used or whatever de-escalation situation occurred where the officer was able to take her into custody and not use deadly force, I, I don't want to see anybody get killed at the hands of law enforcement. And I don't think most law enforcement officers want to have to deploy deadly force. As scary as the situation is, Pack says it isn't that common for an officer to be attacked on the job. The fact of the matter is, is that officers, you know, and most stops go completely compliant. You know, the vast majority of law enforcement contacts with civilians and citizens in the country, they don't end in anything other than maybe a warning or a ticket at the most. So the good news is most law enforcement contacts, people comply with officers. They have no ill will towards the officer. In fact, Pack says he's never been attacked while working as an officer, but he's familiar with it happening to others on the force. I've always been pretty lucky in my 23 years on the job and, you know, being six foot three and a kind of a bigger stature guy, I, I was, you know, kind of had a little bit of that maybe intimidation factor of the, the, the bat belt and the uniform and all that stuff played in my favor. So me, I was lucky I was never personally attacked, but I had people who ran, you know, they, they did run and I had some fight issues where people just wanted to fight, but it wasn't anything where they were trying to kill me or try to hurt me so bad that they could affect an escape. But I had partners and I had many people who I worked with throughout the years 
who were attacked, uh, kind of like a, a surprise, almost like an ambush style attack where somebody is completely compliant one second and then it's like a, a, a switch got flipped and then they all of a sudden became violent and tried to hurt my partners or, or other law enforcement officers that I, I knew. Do we know what could have caused something like this? Why some people are sometimes compliant and then all of a sudden completely change? Well, it's very hard to assess that without knowing the person and who they are. I don't believe the vast, ma I think the vast majority of human beings are fairly peaceful people. I, I know in our country, we do have an element of maybe sociopathic or psychopathic folks, but that's a small segment of the population. I do uh, speculate and I would probably want to know a little bit more about mental illness in situations like this. And then you mix, you know, we have a, a we have a mental illness situation and problem in our country. The politicians don't want to seem to address it. Nobody wants to seem to spend extra taxes for the money to pay to try to house and help folks. And then you combine that with people being under the influence of extremely powerful drugs from all the way from hybrid cannabis strains to now fentanyl, the, the problems that are dealing with our country with fentanyl and heroin and methamphetamine, central nervous stimulants and depressants. Alcohol is in every corner of every shop of America. So you take mental illness, you combine it with controlled substances. Even if it's just a little bit, you can kind of see where that maybe paints a problem for law enforcement. In order to prevent attacks like this, PAC says it all comes down to training. I think ultimately training is the key to making sure that you as a police officer, you kind of know how to handle situations. Training is like an inoculation against the stress of the situation occurring in that moment. You kind of already have something, your brain's already kind of mapped this scenario out. So you can kind of recall that much quicker. You know, for law enforcement and what I continue to mentor and tell Police officers who are still working and out there serving the communities continue to train. If your department doesn't provide enough training, go find training on your own. Yes, it may have to cost you out of pocket. And I, I know that's sometimes a tough thing to do, but any cop worth their salt is willing to spend a little bit of their own money to go and train. Like any quality teacher is going to go out and spend extra money of their own so the students have writing utensils. And then also think about constantly playing the win-then game. When this person does this, then I'm going to respond this way. Understand your tactics, understand which tools you have at your belt and be proficient in those tools. And then ultimately, you know, if you go into the park by yourself, it's, you know, could be a problem. If you go into the park with two or three officers, partners, backup, and you had to wait five, 10 minutes for somebody to get there, uh, that's, you know, maybe gonna deescalate the situation, just having a couple extra police officers on scene and then that person doesn't really feel that they have a plan to even escape and they're just going to have to understand and comply with the with the basic investigation that's occurring and maybe their stress level comes down. In addition to training, PAC suggests a debrief for Brammer and his department. I really encourage, especially some of the smaller law enforcement agencies across our country that don't have massive budgets for training and after action reports, it's really important as the leadership within law enforcement to look at that incident and then identify, kind of go through a critical incident review. What did we do right? What did we do? What could we have done better? Were mistakes made? And ultimately, what, what, what worked out well here? What can we really double down on in training versus what do we really need to think about moving down the road? I would caution against an overreaction or a knee-jerk reaction. Policing is not black and white. I always tell people that the cars are black and white and the policies are written on black and white paper, but life is gray. Policing is gray. And so you have to have general policies that guide law enforcement and training has to kind of try to catch as much the, uh, scenarios that they could possibly deal with. But there's no level of training or policy that can address individual isolated incidents that occur. And while the majority of attacks come at the hands of men, PAC says no one can be ruled out as a potential assailant. Well, the data definitely shows that men tend to be the primary aggressors when it comes to attacks on law enforcement. But again, you can never assume. You can never go up and think that the petite, small 18-year-old girl does not pose a threat to you. And so it's a, it's a really good example when people say, you know, why didn't the officer just do this? She's just a girl. Well, girls can pull triggers on firearms just as capable as men can. Girls can pull edged weapons, as we saw here in this situation, just as easily as a man can. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes uh, the smaller petite female, very, very tough, very, you know, so much martial arts training now, so much uh, access to weaponry, and, and you just don't know what's going on in the mind of a human being. They might seem like they're normal people. They might seem like they're 
just everyday Joe citizen or Jane citizen. To avoid future attacks, PAC suggests officers steer clear of profiling and stay attentive while dealing with any suspect, regardless of race or gender. And I think we like to, people like to have this preconceived notion of what bad people look like. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, a person of color. It's a black guy with dreadlocks. It's a Hispanic guy with a face tattoo. It's a white dude with a shaved head wearing weird clothes. We just, you can't, as law enforcement, you can't assume. And, and that's why I always stress uh, when I was a training officer about like racial profiling. If you racially profile, you only limit yourself to the crime committed by the people that you just have a bias against. And so it's a great example of, you can treat everybody you come across, no matter what their skin color is, no matter what their race, or even if they're their gender, and they could be a, a man or a woman, you have to assume and keep yourself safe, presume that people might have a, a, a plan to hurt you and ambush you, but still treat them with respect and, and try to be as professional as possible. But don't limit yourself. Don't don't fall into the level of a of a bias of like, oh, she's just an 18 year old white girl. She can't hurt me. That's a very dangerous path to go down. You can human beings are human beings. We're I hate to say it, we're hairless murder apes. You know, we're all, you know, we all have this potential to hurt one another. We're, we're a species constantly attacking one another. It's an unfortunate world that we live in and that's just the nature of human beings. Luckily, most of us are good folks, we're good people, we have good hearts and we just wanna see, you know, be treated with respect and, and live our lives for our kids. Van Arsdale was ultimately taken into custody on Saturday and booked into the Bullitt County Detention Center. Brammer was treated by the EMS and he is expected to be okay. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.